Uh, many students are protesting uh, Israel's uh, invasion and bombing of Gaza. I protest it too. I find it uh, war crimes, uh, basically. Um, and to, to say that, though, uh, boy, that runs against uh, what some of these uh, Congress people think uh, or what some of these donors think. And so what? That's what free speech is. Uh, and especially in a moment like this uh, with uh, such high political stakes, political free speech is essential. Now, what happened was that Stefanik uh, deliberately and, and uh, obnoxiously misconstrued uh, words and protests on the campus, uh, specifically uh, in her interrogation, because that's what it was, of uh, President Gay of Harvard, she said that when student uh, protesters, pro-Palestinian protests, by the way, both of Jewish and uh, non-Jewish students, uh, protesting uh, on the side of the Palestinians and against Israeli actions, were uh, chanting intifada or uh, uh, from uh, the river to the sea, meaning the Jordan River to the Mediterranean Sea, they were calling for the murder of Jews. That's what Stefanik said. Uh, no, they were making a political uh, statement. Uh, they were making uh, uh, a statement that was uh, against uh, prevailing Israel government policies. Uh, but they were exercising political speech at a time when we need political debate, because what's happening, in fact, is horrible. Thousands and thousands of uh, women and children are being killed. Uh, and it's natural uh, and important that there be political debate about this. Uh, almost all the world is against Israel's policies, is aghast at Israel's policies, uh, and voted uh, in the UN General Assembly uh, a couple of days ago by uh, a vote of 150 countries to just uh, in favor of an uh, In favor, in favor of a ceasefire. against, yes. Uh, if I've got the number, if I remember uh, the numbers let, correctly. Let me just stop you for a minute. A little I bit know, jet lagged. <laughs> right? I know you want to go uh, deeply into yep. uh, the UN because of your familiarity with it. But, before but, but Judge, have, just, we, just to say before we get off the topic, that what the students are expressing, the, the point I was going to make without uh, digressing to the UN, is they're expressing a view which is widespread around the world. They are not calling for the murder of Jews, as Stefanik uh, in, in a very vulgar and incorrect way said. They are calling for a stop to Israel's war uh, against the Palestinians uh, and calling for a I, is outrageous. But the whole purpose, you know this. Everybody listening to us knows this. Supreme Court has said it a hundred times. The whole purpose of the First Amendment is to keep the government out of the business of speech. It is none of the government's business what the students say on a college campus and how the presidents of the universities respond to it. This Congresswoman Stefanik was just using her power as a member of Congress and a member of this committee and the subpoena power to berate, humiliate, these college presidents, and it cost one of them her job. Well, it was absolute bullying because uh, the very premises of her question were ludicrous and false. First, the whole premise was that students on the campuses are calling for the mass murder of Jews, for the genocide of Jews. This is not the case. Right. They, they are making political speech not advocating murder. She didn't cite one case. And when you start looking at this, you find out, and AP did a good job of exposing the falsehoods being carried on the social media, literally putting words uh, in videos into the mouths of the protesters, which is not what the protesters are actually saying. So Stefanik, either knowingly or ignorantly, was... Uh, misconstruing what the protests are about. And then, uh, as the 
university presidents were grappling with the what for them was a hypothetical because their students are not calling for a genocide or a murder of Jews. And they were asked about it. They said, uh, well, uh, you know, whatever kind of speech has to be considered in context. And that statement was viewed as, oh, so intellectual. Uh, we need to fire <laughs> this uh, president. Mm -hmm. And and actually the president of UPenn stepped down, uh, which is so sad. We don't, I don't know the full background to that. Uh, the chair of the board stepped down as well. What we do know is that they were bullied, not only by uh, the Congress, but by some of their big donors from Wall Street. And these people can be real bullies. Right, right. Um, tell us about the uh, U.S. veto of the very sensible humanitarian uh, resolution calling for a ceasefire in the Security Council. A couple of questions. How do American diplomats react at the UN when they are so overwhelmingly at odds? Did the US uh, attempt to dissuade the General Assembly from its vote after the veto in the uh, Security Council? How does this play out when the U.S. is so isolated and isolated along with a country whose murderous rampages it could stop with a phone call? Well, this is uh, the key point. The U.S. is not uh, an observer to, the, to what is happening. The U.S. is a direct and not just in a political sense, uh, in a logistical sense, a direct accomplice. It is U.S. munitions that are being used by Israel, and not from stockpiles, from current, ongoing, daily deliveries of munitions. The United States is working hand-in-hand -hand with Israel in this campaign in Gaza. Now, this so-called uh, military campaign in Gaza against uh, Hamas, as it said, has displaced nearly 2 million people who are now crowded, hungry, dying of disease, without access to health care, and at latest count, uh, a verified count of uh, 18,000 people killed, and probably many, many more under the rubble. And 70% of those women and children. And the United States is providing daily the weapons for this. So what does the world community say as represented by the governments, uh, the 193 member states of the UN? It says overwhelmingly, stop this. Stop this killing. This is mass civilian slaughter before our eyes. And by the way, with a political end that is utterly unacceptable because what does the Israeli government say? It doesn't say we're defeating Hamas so we can have justice with the Palestinian people. Netanyahu, who in my view is an absolute corrupt thug, says never to a Palestinian state. So what is the outcome of this also? The outcome is this idea of complete Israeli control over Palestine. This is a, a vision that many of his members of the cabinet have of the so-called greater Israel, which in which Israel either expels the Palestinians or it dominates them in an apartheid state. But Netanyahu is not even offering a political solution that is even remotely acceptable morally or according to international law. Now, the United mm -hmm. States is, is siding with this. So the vote was 150 governments calling for an immediate ceasefire, 10 opposing. That's the United States and a few very small countries, the largest mm -hmm. Guatemala and Paraguay, and then a few islands. Uh, and then 23 countries abstaining. Now, if you look at the share of the world accounted uh, by these votes, 
nearly 90% of the world lives in the countries that voted stop the killing. The United States uh, on the side of 5% of the world population, four ourselves in the US and another 1% uh, these other countries and 5% abstaining. In other words, we are isolated diplomatically and even our closest allies right now are saying privately or publicly, we can't go on with a mass slaughter of civilians before our eyes. And then these geniuses in the White House, oh, Jake Sullivan, not my favorite, says, okay, just a few more weeks of the slaughter. It's going to have to come to an end. Just right. a few more weeks. Means with which to do it. Do conversations like that happen either between heads of state or among diplomats at the UN? They are happening right now. Uh, and Netanyahu is uh, showing the finger to the American president, uh, by the way, because Biden, uh, in a kind of a pathetic and weak way, is saying, well, you know, we, we, we need a two state solution and, and so forth. And Netanyahu is saying, hell no, no two state solution. We determine things. And the United States says, okay, we back you up, whatever you want, we'll keep sending the weapons. So uh, who's, who's running things? Whose weapons are these? Whose bombs are these? These are our bombs. And, and if we wanted to stop this, it's not even convincing Israel to do something. Stop providing the bombs. Literally, it's a logistical matter. It's not even a political matter. We are an accomplice to this. So if Biden want something different, stand up and be a president. The Israeli defense forces uh, captured uh, young civilian men, stripped them down into their underwear, paraded them in front of cameras. There's three war crimes right there, the kidnapping, the stripping, and the parading in front of the cameras, um, and claimed that they were Hamas soldiers surrendering. That, of course, has been debunked. The tape of the of the so-called surrender was farcical. These guys were not were not soldiers at all. But when this happens, the the international humiliation of innocent civilians. What does this do for Israeli and American standing in the world community? And how, if at all, does it exacerbate things to the point where other countries in the region will be forced by popular demand to do something? Look, the, the United States uh, is uh, essentially completely isolated together with Israel in this. As, as I said, 1% uh, of the world population uh, joined the United States in the veto of this General Assembly resolution, a few tiny countries, that's it. And we should take note if we care anything uh, about uh, uh, American diplomacy, not that we do anymore, uh, but if we care anything about American standing in the world, uh, not that we seem to, uh, <laughs> but from a practical point of view, of course we're, we're completely isolated. I can't remember of all the horrible things that, that happened. I can't remember another time so vividly when we see hour by hour the mass slaughter of people, when we hear the vulgarities coming from the government of Israel about how these are animals or we're going to starve them out, when we see actually nearly 2 million people displaced and their homes destroyed. And we can't figure out in the United States to do something different about this when it's our very bombs that are literally the, the, the bombs that are uh, causing this destruction. It's so, shocking to me. Now, what also Biden doesn't understand is that he's lost the American people on this and especially the young people. You know, this is partly a generational issue. Young people who don't have uh, wh whatever uh, perspective that older people do on this just see Israel killing 
civilians in a way that is completely unacceptable. And that's why they're protesting on the campuses also, and possibly why these older donors don't get it. But this is America now. We don't, uh, we, we so don't like Joe, what's happening. Is Joe Biden just stuck in a time warp where the United States is wedded at the hip to Israel? Does he not have his finger on the pulse of what the public wants? Surely the Congress doesn't have their collective fingers on the pulse of what uh, the public wants. If you look at the uh, APAC uh, website, you'll see more than half the members of Congress's faces there. And all you do is click on the APAC website to donate to those members of Congress. This list goes on and on and on and on. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, uh, conservatives. So it, 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 it's it, it, the United States of America at odd, odds with the normal human sensibilities of the American public, which is repulsed by what they see. We know from opinion surveys that Americans are disgusted. They do not support at all Biden administration policies. It has been uh, an, an absolute uh, automatic uh, standard of American politics. Don't show any space with Israel, no matter what. That has been uh, the, the the programmed logic of uh, Congress and presidents for for decades. But it is not the view of the American people that that is a license to mass slaughter of civilians. And especially, and I think it's important to understand, um, there's no end game here other than, according to Israel, no end game other than Israeli domination of the Palestinian people, either their deaths or ethnic cleansing or living in an apartheid state because our ally, the one that we are providing the bombs to every day, is saying straight out, no, no, there's not going to be a Palestinian state. And our president says, well, yeah, I know there needs to be a two-state solution. And uh, who uh, who gets the bombs and who keeps the killing? Right. Israel. So, right. you know, I, I, it's it's really, uh, this is how our politics has worked, but it's completely out of tune with the views of the American people now. Uh, and certainly, generationally, there's an enormous change. And worldwide, there is a revulsion. I've been traveling, as usual. Uh, I was in the Middle East. I was at uh, the climate conference uh, in the United Arab Emirates. I was in Ethiopia. Uh, I've heard nothing but uh, horror uh, at uh, what Israel is doing and at what the United States is abetting. Uh, not a voice to the contrary. People should understand this. And uh, if, if the view is doesn't matter, uh, public opinion doesn't matter, world opinion doesn't matter, international law doesn't matter, uh, UN Security Council resolutions be damned, it's not a good thing, I will tell you, for the United States of America. We need normal relations with other countries. We can't be seen and should not be accomplices to war crimes, which unfortunately we are being right now. And by the way, the job of a president of the United States is to be more effective than whining. Right. I want you to listen to or, and watch um, a comment from Colonel uh, McGregor on the concept of asabia. You probably know what this is, and I'd like your uh, thoughts on it. It's fascinating. So for us to talk about uh, a just peace for the Palestinians in the minds of Arabs, Turks, and Iranians is essentially to say, we, we'll give you a just peace. It's called the cemetery. You, we'll give you the peace of the grave, and that's about it. Now, that satisfies the current government of Israel, but it puts us in a very difficult position globally as well as regionally. Now, the second point I want to make, and I think this is very important, there, there is a concept or a word in, in Arabic called asadiyya. Uh, this is a word you don't hear much anymore, but it's a word that refers to social cohesion, group solidarity, or unity of action. It is a word that was used by Ibn Khaldun, 
probably the most uh, famous historian of the Middle Ages, who happened to have been an Arab from Tunis. His work had a profound impact on the West. Everyone from Toynbee to Oswald Spengler all studied and read his works. And in it, he says, those who have not seen the power of, of Islam do not appreciate it. Today, we, we have historically viewed, and today we view Islam as weak, uh, a, a loose grouping of states that are more interested in killing each other than they are in doing any damage to anyone else. There have been a, a few exceptions, but that's essentially the, the analysis. Asadiyya, however, is emerging in the Arab world. It's emerging because of this war for Jewish supremacy in the region that we are supporting. And it is bringing states and peoples into coalition now that historically have not cooperated in any meaningful way for centuries. What do you think, Professor Sachs? Well, I, I think uh, the, the one word I would change of that uh, brilliant analysis is uh, it's not uh, Jewish domination, it's Israeli domination, because there are a lot of Jews that are aghast uh, at uh, what is happening. Uh, and um, I think this is really important to state. This is a policy of an Israeli government uh, that has also whipped up the Israeli public. But this is about Israel. Uh, it's not about a religion. Uh, but I think what uh, Colonel McGregor is saying is absolutely right. And what is important to understand, and this is really crucial for us to understand and for our public discourse, the Arab and Islamic leaders more generally have been stating repeatedly in the United Nations, uh, in a very important meeting in Riyadh, and in many meetings of the Arab League and Arab nations, that they want actual peace with Israel. But the peace is with two states, a state of Israel and a state of Palestine. And this also is what the United Nations has repeatedly called for in resolutions over many decades. The Arabs and Islamic leaders, and I am including Iran in that, just in case anybody is uh, not sure about the point, are calling for peace with a two-state solution. They are not calling for the elimination of Israel. They are calling for the creation of a sovereign Palestinian state as the 194th member of the United Nations. And who stands directly against that is Netanyahu and his right-wing, extreme right-wing cabinet. And who abets Netanyahu that is the president of the United States who murmurs, oh, we, we want a two-state solution, and then provides the bombs for an ethnic cleansing of Gaza and mass murder. So this is <laughs> pathetic. Uh, it's not as if there isn't an answer to this. There is an obvious answer to this. The answer is two states living side by side. And Netanyahu, even today, is explicit. No way. We're not going to do that. That's not what we're doing. And uh, <laughs> what does the U.S. government do? It says, okay, here are some more bombs. Go ahead. I don't know how this ends, uh, Jeff. Uh, Colonel McGregor and uh, Scott Ritter are two uh uh, military experts believe it will be expanded into a regional war that Netanyahu will not stop. Others believe Netanyahu will be driven uh, from office and a new administration will stop the war. What do, what do you think? How does this end? We took a poll, Jeff, uh, among uh, the viewers of the show. Hundreds of people uh, responded. When do you think the war will end? One month, two months, three months? Uh, was 47% longer than six months. You know, I'm, I'm not very good at uh, forecasting. Uh, I'm, uh, I think, a little bit better uh, at uh, recommending what could happen. Uh, what I have recommended in my uh, rather extensive discussions with diplomats around the world in recent days is that 
the United Nations should vote immediately for the state of Palestine to become the 194th member of the United Nations along the 4th of June 1967 borders, as has been called for repeatedly by the UN Security Council and therefore is international law. Because uh, with Palestine as a sovereign state and member of the United Nations, I believe would uh, force the United States into the right answer. The right answer is that Israel can be secure with two states. Israel can never be secure with Netanyahu's approach. And the way to get to the two states is for the United States to say it is not acceptable by international law or U.S. policy or human morality to use American bombs to bring about your greater Israel solution. And the United States just needs to say that at any moment. It needs to say within the UN Security Council, together with the other 14 members that absolutely would agree, absolutely would agree in a moment that the state of Palestine exists according to UN Security Council resolutions that date back for decades. So is that going to happen? Uh, you know, perhaps not. Perhaps uh, Biden will continue uh, to obfuscate, uh, to uh, murmur, uh, to uh, be weak uh, in, in the sense of not standing up for international law and uh, U.S. Uh, uh, US uh, interests of a normal, peaceful, decent world. Uh, that uh, the U.S. will continue to block the obvious diplomacy. And let me add, and maybe it's uh, obvious, but let me just uh, expand for one moment. The way to make Israel secure is through a political solution, because what the Arab and more generally the Islamic countries are saying is, we will support Israeli security. We that means stopping the funding for militias uh, like Hamas, stopping the armaments uh, for resistance movements, uh, providing peacekeepers under UN Security Council guidance. With a little bit of imagination, we could provide for Israeli physical security and end this conflict. But the whole game is to avoid the obvious. Netanyahu says the obvious, so we can listen. He says no political solution other than Israeli dominance. And we have to say, no, we don't sign up to that, and we don't give you bombs to enable you to do that. And then everything changes. We move to politics. We don't give up on Israel's security. We move to the demilitarization and demobilization, not only of Hamas, but of all of the other. See, that's the plan. It's not even subtle. So Putin said in 2007, look, we want to cooperate. We're trying to cooperate, but don't keep expanding NATO because you said <laughs> not one inch eastward. And now you have it's 10 countries and now it's going to be 12 and then it's going to be 14 and you're surrounding us okay again the united states didn't listen but there was bad luck for the u.s which is the ukrainian people did not want nato expansion if you look at the opinion surveys and just go on wikipedia to take a look because they're all collated in wikipedia the surveys at each date about 10 surveys large majorities against NATO enlargement. And President Viktor Yanukovych was elected and became president in 2010. And he pushed for Ukraine's neutrality. And he pushed for Russia to have a long-term lease till 2042 in Sevastopol and the Black Sea region where the Russian fleet has been based since 1783. Ah, 
that's a good reason to overthrow him, which is what the U.S. policy became by the end of 2013. So when protests broke out over Yanukovych's delay in signing an EU accession agreement, and whether those protests were originally provoked or originally spontaneous, I'll leave it to Professor Kachanovsky to help us understand. But soon they were militarized and paramilitarized by really um, violent groups, from, especially from Western Ukraine. And we know from a taped intercept on February 6th, 2014, Victoria Newland discussing who the next government is going to be two weeks later. And she describes on the tape her partners back in Washington. Who are they? The Veep, that's uh, Joe Biden, and the Veep's national security advisor, that's Jake Sullivan. So the team is the same team as in power right now that played the overthrow of Yanukovych. Now, when the overthrow occurred, I got a call, oh, come to Kiev and meet the new government. And when a government asks, I went. And when I went, the Maidan was still swirling with people and a U.S. person explained to me, oh, how the U.S., they were so proud how the U.S. had helped finance this, uh, uh, this uh these demonstrations. This was an NGO explaining how much money they had put into financing the demonstrations. It made me sick, by the way, to know this, the contrivance and the uh, role of the United States in the overthrow. Okay, we're not allowed to talk about any of that, so please keep this uh, to ourselves. It's just 467 of us, but you will not read about this at all. Then we know the war broke out, not in February 2022. The war broke out in February 2014. And again, Professor Kachanovsky is by far the authority on what happened in Odessa, what happened in Crimea, what happened in the Donbass. But already this was civil war and Already, by 2015, NATO was pouring in weapons. And there was a UN-backed attempt at peace, especially the Minsk II agreement, and supposedly co-guaranteed by France and Germany, and the Ukrainians brazenly this new Ukrainian U.S. NATO-backed government just said, we're not implementing that. So they signed it. They didn't implement it. Angela Merkel said uh, a few months ago in a quite notorious interview, oh, no, 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 it was just to buy time for Ukraine so it could strengthen itself. Well, billions of dollars of weapons went in. Biden came into office and Putin put forward a draft security agreement in December 2021 that was to be an agreement between NATO and Russia on security arrangements, calling for, at the center, stopping the enlargement. I spoke to White House officials, a, a senior White House official at the end of 2021. I said, Avoid the war, for heaven's sake, stop the NATO enlargement. Do you get it? This has been the issue all along. And I was told, never, we will never negotiate over that issue. NATO has a, quote, open door, just like I'm sure we'd say with Mexico, if it allies with China. I can't say the real word that applies to this because it's not in polite company, but this is not grown-up behavior. This is provocation of war. So in the middle of January 2022, the U.S. formally rejected 
any discussion about NATO enlargement. And if you read the minutes of Russia's National Security Council meeting on the eve of the invasion, and the meeting took place, I believe it was the 21st of February, you can see all the statements, they're all about NATO. Putin opens, he says, we tried to stop NATO enlargement, but they weren't serious. And the United States is without any credibility whatsoever. And then Lavrov speaks next, and he describes the negotiating process and how it failed, and that uh, the uh, NATO countries were unwilling to discuss the disposition of NATO. Okay, that's the war. The war broke out within a month. Zelensky said, you know, maybe we could be neutral. And negotiations started in Ankara with Turkish mediation. And I spoke to the Turkish mediators. I spoke to people who were deeply involved in this. There was rapid progress made on the basis of Ukrainian neutrality. Then one day the Ukrainians showed up and said, no, uh, we're taking a pause from the negotiations. The best estimate given to us by former Prime Minister Naftali Bennett in a very interesting long interview that he gave online a couple of months ago said, yeah, the U.S. stopped it. He said, I didn't agree with them, but they thought that they needed to be tough towards China, that it would be a sign of weakness to go along with this. Honest to God. Honestly, it's worse than five-year-olds. And so the war continued, the negotiations ended. We've had another year. They don't care about the lives lost in Washington. They don't care. Even Romney <laughs> wrote an article saying this war is great. Russia is losing, Russia's being bled, and not one American life is being lost. He actually had the stupidity to write that, or the, the evil to write that. Okay, that's the story. If we want this war to end, we got to negotiate, and it's got to be based on no NATO enlargement. There is no other way this war will end. Why? Because if Ukraine is victorious on the battlefield, Russia will use nuclear weapons. And if Ukraine fails on the battlefield, well, the whole thing's moot. And the third option is the war goes on forever, which is American-style wars. Yeah, sure, we can just fight forever. If we want peace, we actually have to tell the truth which is that there are limits to NATO enlargement. And I'm sorry to say Canada is absolutely an accomplice to this. And what's a shame for me is I grew up in Detroit, Michigan. Canada was due south for me, so you were my southern neighbor uh, in Windsor. I always regarded Canada as the sane part of the continent because I knew that the United States was the crazy part of the continent. But I'm not seeing in Canadian leadership now any honesty about this at all. I'm sorry to tell you. And I've had some interactions that I don't like because this is all gung-ho militarism. And uh, as uh, Bianca said at the opening, uh, the foreign minister it was the foreign minister, right, Bianca, who said, this is not the time to talk about peace. This is the time for war. We don't have diplomats anymore, ladies and gentlemen. We just have diplomats trying to prove that they're warmongers. We don't have any diplomats because life doesn't matter. It's Ukrainians there. And the Ukrainians, well, they are suffering beyond belief. Their government has gambled everything of their country on the U.S. backing. It's a terrible gamble. I tried to tell them.
ask the Vietnamese, ask the Nicaraguans, ask, ask Afghanistan, ask Libya, ask the Syrians. Is it great to gamble with the U.S. as your backer? Not so good. This conflict is actually decades in the making. It didn't just come out of a Russian invasion in 2022, as is often said in the Western mainstream media. The war is often defined as an unprovoked attack in 2022. Actually, the roots of this war go back to the end of the Soviet Union and to the geopolitics around that. In 1990, the U.S. and Germany promised the Soviet government at the time, Mikhail Gorbachev, the president, that NATO would not move one inch eastward if Gorbachev went ahead and disbanded the Soviet military alliance. In other words, there would be a deal that on the Soviet side, the military alliance, the so-called Warsaw Pact, would be ended. And on the Western side, NATO would not take advantage and Germany would be reunified, but NATO would not move one inch eastward. The U.S. cheated on that because as soon as the Soviet Union ended in 1991, the policymakers in Washington, especially in the Pentagon and in the permanent state in the United States, immediately planned for the eastern expansion of NATO. And by 1992, Ukraine was already on the list that NATO would go that far. In fact, Spignu Brzezinski, a U.S. major geostrategist wrote in 1997 the timeline for NATO expansion, including that Ukraine would become candidate between 2005 and 2010, which is exactly what happened. So this war started, in my opinion, because the United States could not accept a peace in which the military alliances of both sides of the Cold War would stand down. Well, many things happened over the 30 years between the early 1990s and today, but probably the highlights to mention are that in 2008, George W. Bush Jr. forced NATO, pushed NATO, but really pressed that NATO would announce that Ukraine would become a member. And that happened at the Bucharest NATO summit in 2008. The Russian leadership was furious. They had warned again and again, don't do that. We don't want your military right up against our 2,000 kilometer border with Ukraine. Then a Ukrainian president won the election in 2010 on the program of neutrality for Ukraine. Viktor Yanukovych won the election based on the idea that Ukraine doesn't want to become the battlefield between two superpowers and called for neutrality which had been enshrined in the original Ukrainian Declaration of Independence, but then was abandoned by some of the NATO-oriented politicians of Ukraine later on. So in 2010, Yanukovych called for neutrality, but he was overthrown violently in early 2014 with the U.S. participation. So this was really a terrible escalation because the relatively pro-Russian president, but one who called for neutrality, which I think was the only safe course for Ukraine, was overthrown and the United States played a significant role in that. People know about the famous tape of Victoria Nuland, who was now our Under Secretary of State. At the time, she was the Assistant Secretary of State, and she described who the U.S. would see as the next government three weeks before a violent overthrow. It's, it's pretty ugly business, in my opinion. Well, in any event, the war started in February 2014. It escalated between 2014 and 2021. The attempt to end the fighting at the end of 2014 and early 2015 came in two agreements called the Minsk Agreements, in which the government of Ukraine agreed with the breakaway regions of eastern Ukraine that those regions would gain autonomy. And then the government of Ukraine failed to implement the Minsk II agreements, even though they were endorsed by the UN Security Council. So the diplomacy failed again. And when Biden came into office in 2021, rather than trying to de-escalate, he called for NATO enlargement and reinforced the U.S. push to expand eastward. Putin strongly pushed back. Biden pushed back. The U.S. signed several 
statements in 2021 confirming that NATO would enlarge. I think this was all absolutely irresponsible. Russia masked troops on its border and put on the table a draft U.S.-Russia security agreement on December 17th, 2021, based on no NATO enlargement. The Biden administration formally replied that it was not willing to negotiate over that issue in a a response in January. Then Russia invaded on February 24th, 2022, making clear that it was the failure to reach an understanding on the NATO question that was central to Russia's action. Four weeks later, Zelensky declared that Ukraine was accepting of neutrality. In other words, the initial Russian invasion brought Ukraine to the negotiating table. And during the second half of March, with the Turkish government being the mediators, Russia and Ukraine hammered out a peace agreement. Incredibly, the United States blocked it because the United States told the Ukrainian government, you fight on because American policymakers had two ideas. One was that Ukraine should not be neutral. It should be a NATO country. And second, that the war would be won by some combination of Western armaments and financial sanctions. And so the U.S. ratcheted up the war. Putin said, no, we don't stand down. We fight and mobilized hundreds of thousands of Russians in the summer of 2022. And since then, we've been on a path of military escalation. I resent the fact as a citizen threatened by this, that Biden has not negotiated over NATO and that Biden and Putin have not talked once, as far as we know, since February 24th, 2022. You know, when two sides are fighting, they need to talk and negotiate. But that's rejected. The hardliners in the United States, Newland, Blinken, Sullivan, Biden, say, why negotiate? We just escalate. We'll defeat Russia. This is, in my view, utterly reckless and irresponsible. First, it leads to the destruction of Ukraine. And second, it risks the escalation to nuclear war. So I'm very unhappy about this. And I very much resent that the mainstream media like to I have been an advisor to the governments of Russia, Ukraine, and the United Nations. And I want to speak with you about the truth about this war. We are not at the one year anniversary of the war. This is the ninth anniversary of the war. The war began with the violent overthrow of Ukraine President Viktor Yanukovych a coup that was backed by the United States government. From 2008 onward, the United States was pushing NATO enlargement to Ukraine and Georgia. Yanukovych wanted neutrality. He stood between the US and its goal of NATO enlargement. When protests broke out against Yanukovych at the end of 2013, the United States took the opportunity to escalate the protests and to contribute to a coup against Yanukovych in February 2014. That was the start of the war nine years ago. Since then, Russia took Crimea, war broke out in the Donbas, NATO poured in billions of dollars of weaponry to Ukraine. The war constantly escalated. The so-called Minsk I and II peace agreements in which Germany was to be co-guarantor did not function because Ukraine refused to implement them and Germany and France did not press for their implementation. At the end of 2021, President Putin made clear that the red lines for Russia were NATO enlargement to Ukraine as unacceptable, that Russia would maintain control of Crimea, and that the Donbas needed to be settled by implementation of the Minsk II agreements.
the Biden White House refused to negotiate NATO enlargement. The Russian invasion tragically and wrongly took place in February 2022, eight years after the Yanukovych coup. The United States has poured in massive armament since then, and the death and destruction is horrific. In March 2022, Ukraine said that it would negotiate on the basis of neutrality. We now know that the United States blocked those negotiations, favoring an escalation of war. In September 2022, the Nord Stream pipelines were blown up. The overwhelming evidence is the United States led that destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines. We are, ladies and gentlemen, on a path of dire escalation and lies or silence in the media. The entire narrative that this is the first anniversary of war is already a false narrative. This is a war that began because of NATO enlargement and the U.S. participation in a coup and the massive arming of Ukraine, and then the horrific invasion by Russia and escalation. This is a war that needs to stop before it engulfs all of us in nuclear Armageddon. Thank you for your efforts. We must speak truth. Both sides have lied and cheated and committed violence. Both sides need to back off. NATO must stop the attempt to enlarge to Ukraine and to Georgia. We must listen to the red lines of both sides so that the world will survive. Thank you so much for your efforts for peace. They are vital. Thank you. Of course, we have a, a deadly hot war raging in Ukraine. And um, this is uh, a war uh, ostensibly between Russia and Ukraine, but it's actually a, a war between Russia and the West being fought by Ukrainians in Ukraine. Uh, so unfortunately, this is a war between superpowers, especially Russia and the United States. It's a kind of contest that went terribly wrong over who would control the politics of Ukraine. And Ukraine itself uh, is a complex uh, society, uh, but uh, the United States uh, already 30 years ago uh, had the idea that it would push not only U.S. influence, but the U.S. military alliance, NATO, towards Ukraine. It made that a formal goal in 2008. Russia said, no way are we going to have a U.S. military alliance uh, on our border. Stay away. And that's a red line for us. And so we've had a, a confrontation building now for a long time. I saw it uh, very early on because I was actually an economic advisor to President Gorbachev. I was an economic advisor uh, to President Yeltsin. I was an economic advisor to President Kuchma, who was the first president of independent Ukraine. So I've seen it from both sides. Uh, and um, this confrontation, unfortunately, has been underway. In my uh, view, which is not a very popular one, the U.S. simply failed to show any kind of prudence uh, for 30 years. The Russians kept saying, we don't want your military alliance on our border. Do you hear us? No. Do you hear us? No. And this went on and on and on. In 2008, uh, George W. Bush Jr., in his final year of office, pushed NATO to commit to Ukraine's membership in uh, NATO and uh, Putin was furious and said so to George Bush. In 2014, the United States participated in the overthrow of a pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych. That actually started this war because this war didn't start in February 2022, as is often said in 
in our media, it started in February 2014, actually, with the overthrow of uh, Yanukovych. After that, the U.S. poured in weaponry. Uh, Russia supported separatists uh, in eastern Ukraine, where ethnic Russian populations uh, are concentrated. And we've been at war in a proxy war for eight years. Uh, at the end of 2021, just to bring us up to date, President Putin uh, tried a final time with Biden saying, our red line is NATO enlargement. We need to negotiate. And Biden said, no, we're not negotiating over that. That's Ukraine's right to join NATO. Uh, and um, the war uh, intensified with Russia's invasion on February 24th, 2022. I find all of it utterly tragic and utterly dangerous. Tragic for Ukraine because while the Ukrainian leaders say, yes, we're going to win, they're actually caught in an unwinnable situation. They're trapped in a superpower war. I warned, uh, I'm, I know some of your uh, listeners are, are probably Afghani. I said, you're going to make Ukraine into what happened to Afghanistan uh, over decades. Uh, again, caught in a proxy war, uh, in a war that was only a tragedy for Afghanistan. Now we see Ukraine being pummeled in this way. And um, I think the U.S. Uh, just has been terribly unwise. I don't like what Putin has done, but this has been a building confrontation. And, and that's, that's the sad part of it. And by the way, if you analyze it politically in this way, it also gives you the sense of how to get out of this, because what really needs to happen is Joe Biden needs to pick up the phone and say to Putin, we've heard your red line. NATO is not going to advance to Ukraine. Now you get the heck out of Ukraine. And that's the basis of how the deal could be made. Just just on that, because <clears throat> you said in a recent interview as well that we're not using diplomacy. Um, in this current situation, you know, how important is diplomacy? You've, you've talked about how it may be the way to the solution and kind of peace um, in this scenario. And China gets a lot of credit, in my view, for having the wisdom to see that that was a conflict that could be solved, not just exacerbated. But the U.S. approach was always to push at it. Uh, even when the U.S. made an agreement with Iran, the, the nuclear agreement called the JCPOA, the U.S. government walked away from it. And then it maintained sanctions on Iran because the U.S. is not really serious at making peace most of the time. It's got an us versus them mentality. And I find that very destructive and not in the U.S. interest. Yes. And I hope that China maintains this sensible approach because it's dangerous what's happening now in Taiwan. And just help us understand the situation like and that through line between you know, these proxy wars and what could happen in China. Well, the situation in Taiwan is like the situation in Ukraine, very explosive, very dangerous, and requires cool heads to avoid a conflict. The fact of the matter is that actually all three governments, let me say the United States, uh, Taiwan and China, have a policy that there's one China. And whether it is the government in Taiwan or the government in Beijing, they both say there's one China. They disagree on what happened in 1949 and how China should be governed, but they don't say there are two countries. And the United States, when it established diplomatic relations with the People's Republic of China, very clearly said that there is one China and has one China policy. And that is how to keep peace and uh, to make sure that this tension between Beijing and Taipei does not boil over to open conflict. But the United States started to play games with this. It started to form a military alliance with Taiwan, in effect, which is really coming into a military alliance in the middle 
of one country. And this is an extremely dangerous and imprudent thing to do. And Biden starts talking about how we're going to defend Taiwan. And the American politicians talk about how a war is coming. It's all utterly reckless, irresponsible. And what we should have is trying to reduce tensions, diffuse tensions through negotiation, through talk, through peace building ideas, rather than stoking the idea that some conflict is inevitable. A conflict would be devastating, of course, first and foremost for Taiwan, but actually for the whole world. And so this needs to be avoided and we need cool heads and we shouldn't have American politicians saber rattling. We should not have Speaker Nancy Pelosi fly to Taiwan after the Chinese government has repeatedly said, don't do that. Don't provoke. Don't stir up things. Don't make conflicts where there don't have to be conflicts. But the United States leadership doesn't listen very well. It's the same thing that when Putin said many, many, many times, do not expand NATO to Ukraine. The United States, oh, sorry, we don't hear you. It's, you have nothing to say about that. That's none of your business. And that war comes. This is very typical of American foreign policy because American foreign policy leaders are too arrogant and they don't listen. Yes. And now 61 years since the Cuban Missile Crisis, you do think we learned our lesson. And of course, America would never accept a military alliance on its doorstep, you know, say coming down from Canada or something like that. Well, of course, when Cuba aligned with the Soviet Union in 1960, the U.S. idea was invade. That's it. It didn't say, oh, Mr. Castro, you could do what you want. It's an open door. If you want to be with Soviet Union, that's fine with us. No, it said, well, we we invade. So that was 1961. In 1962, in the repercussions of that and in a really reckless gamble and reckless action by the Soviet Union putting missiles into Cuba, this whole conflict escalated to just the brink of nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. And then in 1963, both President Kennedy and Soviet Chairman Nikita Khrushchev said, you know, we have to pull back from the brink. We have to live together. We should not be coming to the edge of global nuclear war. And they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty in the summer of 1963, proving that even at the height of the Cold War, if the mindset is right, you can make peace. And that's the mindset that we need now. Yes, it seems like the neocon mindset never really went away. You know, just help us understand, because to my mind, you know, Ukraine is not indispensable for the U.S., right? It's just this idea of NATO enlargement. But there's other forces behind the scenes that are, you know, profiting or pushing. And I understand that Zelensky, you know, secured $110 billion in U.S. aid and of course, humanitarian, financial, military support, also like key partnerships with, you know, the BlackRock venture capital firm, Goldman Sachs, to privatize Ukrainian assets. So that would then deepen the country's debt. So help us understand that a little, the path forward. How do we get out of this? Well, when the debate raged initially in the 1990s about the wisdom or lack of wisdom of NATO enlargement, which was contrary to what we had promised and was not wise, a lobbying campaign took place in the United States led by the military industrial complex. Very crude. That's how American politics works. Bring out the big bucks. So it was Raytheon and Lockheed Martin and other big companies became the lobbyists. And then, you know, American congressmen, they salute money. They salute campaign contributions. They salute the lobbyists. And so this is how American politics works. There are always financial interests that are also playing a role here. So we have a mix of ideology, confusion, lack of historical sense, arrogance, and money all stirring the pot. It has very little to do with the American people, though. The American people are not asked about anything. The votes on money for Ukraine are generally almost secret because they're not really debated. They're just measures stuck into some other piece of legislation so that you never have to debate the fact that we've spent more than $110 billion so far on Ukraine and nobody's really been asked about it. Nothing of the American people haven't really been asked. So this is how American politics works. Now, what should be done? 
this war should end by the United States saying that NATO will not enlarge and Russia saying we take our troops home. That's the core of this. That was available in December 2021. It was available in March 2022, and it's still available now. It doesn't solve many, many other issues. What happens to the territories? What happens to Crimea? These are for negotiations. But the basic idea is that the two superpowers back off and that the war stops and that we go to political solutions, not military solutions. And that should be our priority. And so finally, as you think about the future, uh, the prospect of nuclear war, the kind of world that we're leaving the next generation, what would you like young people to know, preserve, and remember? Young people should lead the way to a safer, cooperative, peaceful, and environmentally sustainable and fair world. This is the point. We need to build the future we want, not to feel trapped in this mindless cycle of violence and environmental destruction. The problems that we face are solvable, and they are not driven by the needs of the people. They're driven by greed or power seeking of elites. And we need to have a new generation say, this is not working. We want a world that is at peace, that is shared in prosperity, and that solves the environmental crises, which have become so deep and are neglected in part because we are wasting our time, our lives, our resources on these useless wars. Before we came online, you were telling me that, because I was saying to you that you wrote a beautiful synopsis of the Ukraine war, which I tweeted about. I didn't want to talk to you today about the Ukraine because I've done so many shows on it that I think the listeners are going to get tired of it. And your take on the war is basically identical to mine. But you wrote this very, very, really useful synopsis that then you you publish on your website and I tweeted and it had it had, it kind of had a, the whole setup about, you know, the provocations that led up to the war and how the, the principal doyens, the most respected graybeards of, of American foreign policy in both political parties, George Kennan, who, you know, who was the architect of the containment policy, Bill Perry, who was the, who was Bill Clinton's secretary of defense, and who threatened to resign because he saw that we were provoking the Russians by moving NATO so close and then Bill Burns, who was the ambassador of Russia, who said this, you know, you can't. And is, and is now the CIA director, after all. And he wrote that memo in 2008. And he said, you know, you are going to provoke the Russians to war. This is a line that you can't be crossed. The, the title of his, his email was, Niet means Niet. The, you are crossing red lines here by and then you and you go back to Zbigniew Brzezinski, who was kind of the, you know, the figurehead of the neocon movement who, after we made the promises in 1991 and 1992, in exchange for Russia moving all of its troops out of East Germany and us unifying East Germany under NATO and saying, we promising we won't move new, move NATO one inch to the east. And then Brzezinski does this plan, publishes this plan in 1997 that lay, lays out the rollout about how we're going to encircle Russia with NATO. And all these guys, the you know, the most respected people are saying, you can't do that. You, you got to stop treating Russia like an enemy or she's going to become an enemy. You're going to, it's going to be a self-fulfilling prophecy and you're going to provoke her. You know, this before Putin was in there, they were saying. This. So you you laid it out perfectly in this. And you and I were, were talking and you told me that you had originally, I said, it, it's kind of a perfect editorial length. It's about 800 words, right? And you said, yeah, I wrote it for the New York Times, and that's the length that the Times asked you to do, 750 to 800. You said that you gave it to the Times, and you went in and argued with their editorial board, and they didn't want to hear you. And I've had those kind of arguments with them on other issues. When they, it's just like talking to a wall. And they're, you know, respectful, but, you know, it's like the, the words bounce off of them. There's no, they're impervious to logic, to reason, to facts, to anything. It's very, it's really extraordinary because these are some of the most intelligent, thoughtful people in the world, supposedly, and yet logic has no effect, impact on them. Uh, they're armored against it. And you said that then, they said, well, you can do an op-ed. So you did the op-ed and they, they, they edited it, they screw with it as they always did. And then, you know, at the last minute, they tell you, oh, we're not going to go with it. No, but the funny thing, by the way, I did the op-ed. It was accepted. We did some edits. I thought the edits were fine. 
they sent it back in the New York Times font. You know, so that's the stage we were at. We were at the stage where you press the button and it goes in into the paper. So it was all there. And then the la- I felt pretty good, you know. And in fact, I have to say my family was amazed. They're going to run your thing? And I said, yeah, you know, we, we really talked. They disagreed, but they're, they're going to run it. And then the last moment when it's already in New York Times setting, the, the editor writes me, oh, I have bad news. Sorry, we're not going to run it. One of our regular contributors is going to say something like this. I don't want to clog the pages. <laughs> so it was, whoa, that's a little weird. Like a, a story that relates to global survival. You couldn't run a, one guest essay of a few hundred words in addition after accepting it. And so I said, who is it? Silence. Uh, so I look day after day, you know, who's this contributor that's saying that the war was provoked by NATO? Nothing like it. Nothing like it. So days go by. I, you know, I write to them. I was still searching. Who's your contributor? Because now we're, you know, 10 days later, I don't see anything like this. And then a couple of days ago, uh, there was another unbelievably aggressive, we got to get them the F-16s, another escalation, you know, on the road to, to what, to Armageddon? And so I said, oh, is that the piece? <laughs> you know, and, and uh, of course, they don't answer that also. it's In other words, they just won't have a public debate. That's it. Not in their pages. That's it. They just want to feed a line, and they don't want to hear any other lines, even for public discussion. And this is an this is an op-ed page. It's not their policy. It's just to have a public discussion. And Bob, you know, I happen to know a little bit about this. I was actually an economic advisor to Gorbachev. I was an economic advisor to Yeltsin. I was an economic advisor to President Kuchma, the first president of independent Ukraine. I was friend of President Yushchenko, the second president of independent Ukraine. I've been called to give them advice on things. I'm following this for 30 years. And I asked for 700 words. No way, because they don't want any public debate, by the way, about the obvious. And interestingly, you know, it's it's quite interesting. Somebody wrote to me a couple days ago, asked me a question. Then he wrote back again saying, by the way, Professor Sachs, I was on the Italian negotiating group in the Bucharest NATO summit in 2008, which was when Bush pushed the statement by NATO that Ukraine would become a NATO member. And I know what this guy told me, said we were aghast. You know, all the Europeans, the French, the Germans, the Italians, they knew this was a terrible thing. And he wrote to me a couple of days ago just to describe what I knew already in 2008, because my European friends in high position said, what's your president doing with this provocation? So these are obvious things. Our own diplomats said it. We made commitments. The Europeans said it. But there's a silence on it in this country. Even as we're heading towards more escalation, more than $100 billion already sent to this disaster, so many people losing their lives. And we don't have a, a public debate in, in our mainstream press, mainstream media, in fact. I want to get back to the New York Times in a minute, but why do you think, you know, Obama came in as kind of a peace president? And, you know, why do you think that uh, that he, you know, went along with this in 2000? You know, I really think, and I learned a lot by studying your uncle's administration and wrote a book uh, about uh, his peace initiatives in 1963, which I think were the most important initiatives on peace in modern times when President Kennedy negotiated the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. And the thing that I really felt after a very deep dive in U.S. foreign policy making is that a president has one main job in foreign policy, and that is to keep the foot on the brakes. Because this war machine is always revving. The military industrial complex is always cooking up new things. The intelligence agencies and their covert operations are always cooking up new things. And you got to keep your foot on the brake. And President Kennedy learned it after the Bay of Pigs. He saw the disaster 
And, you know, Obama had his foot on the brakes on a couple of things, but he lifted his foot off the brakes on many things also, trying to overthrow the Syrian government, a disaster, being talked into the disaster of overthrowing the Libyan government and, and uh, engulfing that country in 10 years of civil war that's not over yet. And he presided over the U.S. role in the overthrow of the Ukrainian president. So there's a lot there. You know, Obama did say we should negotiate with Iran. And that takes a lot of bravery in Washington uh, because there's a lot of forces against that. But he took his foot off the brake because I don't think he had the experience and he didn't understand that's his real job. Stop the wars. Stop the new wars stop the covert operations they're dangerous don't overthrow the ukrainian president for heaven's sake and you know his secretary of state that's another matter she didn't feel that way she she loved all of this stuff i just listened to her talk recently and you know this this is really where we're at we've got a war machine here and you know war machines want to be used they 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 want to bulk up they want to try new weapons uh, they they want to uh, buy new armaments, they want to open new bases, and a president, a smart president, knows to say, no, stop, you're going to get us into a lot of trouble. And Obama did know, by the way, in 2014, don't go more deeply, because he, he said it in an interview, and he got attacked for it, he said, Russia has escalatory dominance, meaning Whatever we do in Ukraine, they care a hell of a lot more about this than we do, and they will just keep escalating to not have NATO along their 2,000-kilometer border. And so whatever we start, it's not going to end well. So he said, at least don't start this, but President Biden doesn't get that. They just keep escalating step by step. They say, we're not going to do this, then they do it. We're not going to do this, then they do it. We're not going to have F-16s, then they do it. And now we have the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Milley, saying, oh, this war could go on for decades. Are you kidding? By the way, that was the first thing I wrote, and I tried to tell the Ukrainians, this is a terrible idea for you. Look at Afghanistan. That's what America does. It gets in there, war that just never ends because they don't know how to end it. And this is what's going to happen to you. And now they say these are grown-ups, supposedly. Grown-ups saying, oh, yeah, the war could go on for... Instead of saying, we got to find a way to peace, which is absolutely possible. That That's really the story of this thing. You, you mentioned about my uncle discovering it during the Bay of Pigs, which he was very suspicious about. He didn't want to do it. He thought, you know, why are we going in there? There were no Russians in... Cuba at that time, it was just a country that had chosen a different form of government that we didn't like. But, you know, in his view, it was not the U.S. job to go in there and correct it. It was, you know, that was the, the job of the Cuban people. And they talked him into it through using a variety of subterfuges and lies. But and afterward, when those men were dying on the beach, he felt so devastated by that that he considered resigning. And he told that to his father. And his father said, it's the best thing that could have ever happened to you because it happened early and now you know who you're dealing with. And, you know, he spent yeah. the next thousand days of his administration saying no to those guys. And, uh, and by the way, he took full responsibility for it in that famous line that success has a thousand fathers and orphan and uh, failure is an orphan. And he said, I stand here. This was my my responsibility. And it was it was a shocking thing. And he found out, <laughs> my God, he found out uh, that uh, there really is a lot that goes on in in the U.S. war machine that is hard to control, really hard to control. I'm a specialist in the global economy, including global trade, finance, infrastructure, and economic state travel. I appear before the U.N. Security Council on my own behalf. I represent no government or organization in the testimony that I will deliver. The destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines on September 26, 2022 constitutes an act of international terrorism and represents a threat to the peace. It is the responsibility of the UN Security Council 
to take up the question of who might have carried out the act in order to bring the perpetrator to international justice, to pursue compensation for the damaged parties, and to prevent future such actions. The consequences of the destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines are enormous. They include not only the vast economic losses related to the pipelines themselves and their future potential use, but also the heightened threat to transboundary infrastructure of all kinds, submarine internet cables, international pipelines for gas and hydrogen, transboundary power transmission, offshore wind farms, and more. The global transformation to green energy will require considerable transboundary infrastructure, including in international waters. Countries need to have full confidence that their infrastructure will not be destroyed by third parties. Some European countries have recently expressed concern over the safety of their offshore infrastructure. For all of these reasons, the investigation by the UN Security Council of the Nord Stream explosions is a high global priority. The destruction of the Nord Stream pipelines required a very high degree of planning, expertise, and technological capacity. The Nord Stream 2 pipelines are a marvel of engineering. Each section of pipe is rolled steel of 4.5 centimeters thickness and with a pipeline internal diameter of 1.15 meters. The pipe is encased in concrete of 10.9 centimeters thickness. The weight of each section of concrete encased pipe is 24 metric tons. The Nord Stream 2 pipelines, some 1,200 kilometers in length, contain around 200,000 pipes. The pipelines sit on the sea floor. Destroying a pipeline of heavy rolled steel encased in concrete at depths of 70 to 90 meters requires a highly advanced technology for transportation of these explosives diving to install the explosives and detonation. To do so undetected in the exclusive economic zones of Denmark and Sweden adds greatly to the complexity of the operation. As a number of senior officials have publicly confirmed, an action of this sort must have been carried out by a state-level actor. Only a handful of state-level actors have both the technical capacity and access to the Baltic Sea to have carried out this action. Include the United States, Russia, the United Kingdom, Poland, Norway, Germany, Denmark, and Sweden, either individually or in some combination. Ukraine lacks the necessary technologies as well as access to the Baltic Sea. A recent report by the Washington Post revealed that the intelligence agencies of the NATO countries have privately concluded that there is no evidence whatsoever that Russia carried out this action. This also comports with the fact that Russia had no obvious motive to carry out this act of terrorism on its own critical infrastructure. Indeed, Russia is likely to bear considerable expenses to repair the pipelines. Three countries have reportedly carried out investigations of the Nord Stream terrorism, Denmark, Germany, and Sweden. These countries presumably know much more about the circumstances of the terrorist attack. Sweden, in particular, has perhaps the most to tell the world about the crime scene, which its divers investigated. Yet instead of sharing this information globally, Sweden has kept the results of its investigation secret from the rest of the world. Sweden has refused to share its findings with Russia and turned down the joint investigation with Denmark and Germany. In the interest of global peace, the UN Security Council should require these countries to immediately turn over the results of their investigations to the UN Security Council. There is only one detailed account to date of the Nord Stream destruction, the one recently put forward by investigative journalist Seymour Hirsch, ostensibly based on information leaked by Hirsch by an unnamed source. Hirsch attributes the Nord Stream destruction to a decision ordered by U.S. President Joe Biden and carried out by U.S. agents in a covert operation that Hirsch describes in detail. The White House has described Hirsch's account as, quote, completely and utterly false, unquote, but did not offer any information contradicting Hirsch's account 
and did not offer any alternative explanation. Senior U.S. officials made statements before and after the Nord Stream destruction that showed the U.S. animus towards the pipelines. On January 27, 2022, Under Secretary of State Victoria Nuland tweeted, quote, if Russia invades Ukraine, one way or another, Nord Stream 2 will not move forward, end quote. On February 7th, President Biden said, quote, if Russia invades again, then there will be no longer Nord Stream 2. We will bring an end to it, end quote. When asked by the reporter how he would do that, he responded, quote, I promise you we will be able to do it, end quote. On September 30th, 2022, immediately following the terrorist attack on the pipeline, Secretary of State Anthony Blinken declared that the destruction of the pipeline is, quote, also a tremendous opportunity. It's a tremendous opportunity to once and for all remove the dependence on Russian energy and thus to take away from Vladimir Putin the weaponization of energy as a means of advancing his imperial design, end quote. On January 28, 2023, Under Secretary Newland declared in testimony to Senator Ted Cruz in the U.S. Senate, quote, I am and I think the administration is very gratified to know that Nord Stream 2 is now, as you like to say, a hunk of metal at the bottom of the sea, end quote. Such language is not at all appropriate in the face of international terrorism. I hope that the United States, together with all other Security Council members, will condemn this act of international terrorism and join together in an urgent UN Security Council-led investigation of this international crime in order to determine the truth. The truth is not yet known by the world, but it is knowable. More than ever, the world depends on the UN Security Council to do its work to stop the escalation to a new world war. The world will be safe only when the permanent members work together diplomatically to solve global crises, including the war in Ukraine. To be fixed, and we need to understand that this is a market failure of a profound sort. And it's quite interesting, by the way. You know, uh, the typical answer is, well, developing countries are risky, they default and so forth. But if you actually look at sovereign debts, as you know well, Carmen Reinhardt has recently done this, for example. Look at all the bonds since the Napoleonic Wars. The rate of return paid, actually paid, not just contracted, but paid by developing countries is several hundred basis points higher than that paid by the rich countries. And so the developing countries have gotten a bum deal for two centuries on this. And we need to fix that and understand that it is actually a failure. Ricardo Hausman was right when he called it original sin or borrowing in someone else's currency. Once you get into that trap, and no country knows this better than Argentina, it's almost impossible to get out of this trap. But if we think about it now with the knowledge that we have, we should be reforming the international monetary and financial system again now. The Bretton Woods system has run its course, and it's time for a new international monetary and financial system. And now to incorporate China into this system, to incorporate a multipolar world, to incorporate uh, digital central bank currencies, mind you, uh, to uh, bridge the financing gap for uh, providing massive amounts of official financing through development banking institutions. There's a lot of wonderful things we could do, but we, and that's why I think the G20 needs to be pushed to be the place to think big now that, you know, we're, we're not in 1944, Now we're not in 1946. Now we're not in 1971. Now in 2022, we need a new set of monetary and financial arrangements. Thank you, Professor Sachs. Uh, Just to um, continue the discussion we're having, I was wondering if you you talked before 
about the worldwide extrapolation that the it's worldwide uh, spread nowadays and uh, i was wondering if you could elaborate on two issues first if you think there is a, a risk that the world could enter a sort of a chronic inflation that the one like the one uh, argentina has had for many years now and is quite uh, familiar with us uh, and second if you think that that's not the case and that the policies are uh, in, uh, the policies that are now um, being uh, carried out are sufficient so uh, what i would like to ask you in that regard is how uh, could these remedies compare to the old remedies that were uh, put into place uh, in the 70s when there was the last inflation because uh, what i think or what i uh, i think this time is different from that experience is the massive uh, monetary stimulus that took place uh, in the last 10 years or so and especially during the pandemic so what is different now is the massive uh, expansion of the central bank balance sheets and uh, i believe that there will be some kind of new solutions that we will have to come up in order to deal with this uh, particular stagflation that we are now facing. So, so these are, are great questions, of course. Uh, first of all, without question, many individual countries of uh, non-key currency countries will be in a situation like Argentina's in, which is that the domestic currency suffers a high inflation. Turkey has a very high inflation rate, of course. Uh, I think several other developing countries will. The, the typical cause of that, of course, is chronic uh, fiscal distress that leads to monetary fragility, uh, a low monetary base, a high substitution between the domestic currency and international currencies, typically the dollar, uh, and therefore a significant fragility of the, of the both the FISC and, and the monetary system. And uh, we can absolutely uh, be sure that several individual smaller countries will face this. Will larger countries face this? It's possible. There are many large economies that are in quite significant uh, economic crisis right now. And uh, Pakistan, Bangladesh, uh, and others, and what happens to them depends a lot on both the internal and the international dimensions of this. I guess the question is, could it happen in the US and Europe uh, the same way in key currency countries? I think that the, uh, the likelihood of a super high inflation in those countries is not large. Uh, because these are countries without much currency substitution. They don't have monetary fragility in the same way. What's possible, by the way, is a, is a prolonged economic crisis. But I doubt a prolonged super high inflation. It could be high inflation at the level of 5 to 15 percent on a chronic basis. That would be absolutely possible. Uh, like. Uh, the late 70s and early 1980s. A lot will depend on specific events, on how these supply shocks uh, work their way out or fail to work their way out. But getting to a really high inflation generally requires a high degree of monetary substitution. The money has to go somewhere. Uh, and uh, in, in countries that don't have currency substitution, because they're key currencies effectively and because those institutions didn't develop through chronic crises uh, it takes a long time and a big mess uh, for that to uh, actually happen once you have it then it's very hard to get out of as argentina knows well because you're constantly battling uh, financial fragility so in argentina a crisis that would hardly be noticed anywhere else becomes a cataclysm in Argentina fairly routinely. Uh, and that is because of how fragile the circumstances are with a 
very high degree of money substitution, low monetary base, and and uh, the smartest macroeconomists uh, uh, in among the taxi drivers and on the streets and in the shops that you'd find anywhere in the world, completely uh, ready to make their currency moves in a way that wouldn't even be known in the United States for you know for uh, years to come. But I think uh, the U.S. and Europe could succumb to a serious social crisis, economic crisis, and so forth. God help us if it's the case, but that is absolutely possible. Uh, and because of the geopolitical tensions, I'm hoping that China will recover well. When the United, the United States at one point really went after Japan in the early 1990s as well. Uh, Japan's slowdown in the 1990s was a little bit of U.S. retribution also. It wasn't just uh, an act of uh, nature. It was, uh, how dare you think you're number one? Uh, the U.S. put on uh, market controls. The U.S. insisted on an overvalued yen, many, many other things, uh, and basically said, we don't let you export to our market anymore. And so uh, I hope that China really hope China doesn't uh, succumb to this kind of uh, U.S. pressures, but it's actually the hope, I think, of some of the U.S. policy that that's exactly what could transpire. So I don't want to be completely uh, bleak and pessimistic. I'm in a somewhat pessimistic mode right now because of the war uh, and because of the rhetoric and because of the tensions, but we, we're not doomed to a prolonged economic crisis, it really comes back to how we handle it.